Yeah. Which is what Yeah. Are you sure? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience. I think, as most of you know, we cannot start our public meeting until uh, the posted time, which is 7 o'clock. So if you see us up here, it's not that we don't want to start talking with you. Um, we can't. So for everyone on the World Wide Web and for all of you, uh, thank you for coming. And since 6 p.m. this evening, this Board of Education has been in closed session for purposes of discussion of lawfully closed meeting minutes, appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal, dismissal of specific employees, litigation when an action against affecting or on behalf of a particular district has been filed or is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, sale or purchase of securities investments or investment contracts, collective negotiating matters, and finally, student discipline cases. Um, so with that, I would like a motion, please. To, uh, uh, we have a, a motion and a second. I look behind me. I thought, oh, look who's here. Um, uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thanks so much. And with that, we will hold on one second here. We got a. Um, would like to again welcome all of you uh, and go over our mission, our all important mission uh, to educate students to be self directed learners, collaborative workers, complex thinkers, quality producers, and community contributors. And Ms. Bell, a roll call, please. Sure. Student Ambassador President Bryce Dunlap, Board Members President Kristen Fitzgerald, Susan Price, Terry Fielden, Jackie Romberg, Donna Wanke, and Mike Gensch. And I would ask you, as you are able to stand up, and Mill Street School is going to help us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening, Board of Education, Superintendent Bridges, Cabinet, and community members. I have with me this evening, thank you, I have with me this evening members of our Environmental Club. Our Environmental Club at Mill Street is sponsored by Mrs. Cheryl Gatch here with us tonight and Ms. Sherry Resser. And I'm going to let the students introduce themselves. I'm Olivia Constantelos. I'm Olivia Duda. Olivia Anderson. Nathan Callstrand. Tommy Porter. Willow Nagai. Isabella Chu. Anthony Dick. Brett Grady. Vishal Yilmon Chili. Hi, my name is Nathan Callstrand and, and I am a fifth grader at Mill Street Elementary School. I haven't been involved with Environmental Club for three, since third grade. We have about 65 students on Tuesday mornings at 7.30 discuss different information that is important about our environment and our school community. One project that we would like to tell you about is the used book sale we hold at our school every year. Hi, my name is Tommy Porter and I am also a fifth grade student at Mill Street Elementary School. I also joined the Environmental Club in third grade. 
The used book sale is a program that our club has held for the last 10 years, but last year we decided to partner with Edwards Hospital Pediatric Wing. The books for sale are all donated the books for sale are all donated from our Mill Street community and we resell them for 25 cents each. The club is responsible for advertising the sale and for setting up the sale before school begins. Hi, my name is Willa Nagai and I am also a fifth grade student and I have been with the Environmental Club since, well, third grade. The used book sale has been so successful that we decided to hold the sale twice a year, once in the fall and in the spring. Our goal is to take all the money we raise and purchase new books to donate to Edwards Hospital. We hope to donate a total of $1,000 in new books to Edwards Hospital by the end of April. We sold over 1,400 books this fall, and we hope to sell the same in the spring. We also write a letter to each child who will get one of our books. We hope this makes them feel better while they are, tr while they are in the hospital. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Go straight, parents, if you'd like to come forward and take a picture of the students while they're up here, come on, feel free to come forward into the middle. You can come right inside here if you'd like. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed your presentation too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. We love it. Junior high and high school kids here tonight. Can't be better than that. Okie doke. Um, good news. I think we have some of that tonight. So I'll turn it over to our superintendent. Can I invite uh, the uh, Director of Student Services from Naperville North, uh, Mr. Jeff Farson, to come forward? And then also if Baylor Griffin is here, if you could come forward. Once a month, uh, the district takes the opportunity to recognize individuals in our school district who exemplify and live the mission through their actions and their words. That comes as a response from input of the community about making sure that we're recognizing students who are making significant contributes to not just our school, uh, but also our entire community. Certainly what we do in our school is very important as well. Although Naperville North is certainly different from his previous school in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, Baylor Griffin made the most of it. His pervasive optimism, his ability to acclimate, and his natural leadership ability got the attention of his peers almost immediately. By the beginning of his junior year, it seemed as though Baylor had been a Husky forever. Now, in his senior year, Baylor serves as a captain of the varsity basketball team, is a link crew leader, that's our freshman mentorship program, and cheers on the blue and orange as a dog pound leader. Additionally, his academic work has earned the respect of his teachers, coaches, and classmates. Respectful and mature, friendly and non-judgmental, helpful and a good listener. Baylor is truly a standout in a class of almost 800. The fact that he effortlessly, pardon me, the fact that he effortlessly collaborates and encourages others to join in and participate is commendable. And for late in the game, for a late in the game transfer student, his academic work and extracurricular work is definitely quality, and he's a community contributor who uh, easily assimilates to the new culture of Naperville North High School. We'd like to welcome Baylor, Mr. Farson. Other words that you'd like to offer. You took most of my words, but I... <laughs> Those were probably your words, weren't they? I, w I want to say, I think, that when Baylor got to our school, he acclimated so quickly, he did seem like he was a Husky forever. He has single-handedly made our school and our senior class just better. 
And I know that Baylor is, he's a humble guy and we are giving him some accolades, the kudos, the congratulations, but he doesn't do it for any of that. He just does it because he's Baylor. Despite the fact that he's a University of Michigan fan, I couldn't think of anyone more deserving. So congratulations, Baylor. Uh, the next group I'd like to uh, invite forward is certainly begin with uh, head coach Dan Iverson. So, coach, if you want to come forward. Uh, for us, this is getting to be a little bit of a routine here, I think, which speaks volumes to uh, Dan's commitment with his uh, coaching staff and his athletes. But once again, we uh, have the honor and privilege of celebrating a state championship for the Naperville North girls cross country team. And I'll invite Dan to introduce the girls and then maybe say a little bit about your team also. Okay. Um, well, I'll introduce... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, assistant coach uh, Craftson and Emory, uh, athletes now. And Emery Griffin, Ella Guppy, Natalie Dunnett, <laughs> Claire Hamilton, Sarah Schmidt, Catherine Abbey, Kayla Glowacki, Anna Mandarino, Ellie Deturis, Jenny Smith. Emily Hamilton, Abby Sikorson, Jenny Gibson, Judy Pendergast, Coach Lauren Crock, and Coach Joanna Wilson. Okay, well, um, <laughs> the, the, these guys um, actually turned in um, maybe one of the, well, pr definitely um, one of the best performances ever in the history of the state um, in terms of uh, at the state cross country meet ever. Um, and so that alone speaks for itself. But I will say I'm particularly proud because we spent not one moment of the season ranked number one. In fact, we were number four in the state going into the, the meet uh, and turned in. I, they. They, they ran a tremendous, tremendous race, and I'm really proud of them. Um, and to, to, to run so historically well is pretty impressive. And then yesterday, actually, they disqualified uh, to go out to be one of the 22 teams in the country competing at the national championships uh, in Portland, Oregon. So uh, I'm really proud of them for on a number of levels. And they're also just awesome kids. So, so anyway, thanks. <laughs> While uh, Coach goes to join his team, then we'll invite parents to come forward into the center here to take pictures. But also, you notice this other stack of green T-shirts here, too. One of the things that really struck us about this team, and I'll get it wrong, but uh, Coach Iverson will correct me very quickly because he already has once, um, is the importance of collaborative work, uh, one of our strands of our mission statements. And one thing that really struck out with us and I think contributes to the success of this uh, group as a team is how they were able to, I think the newspaper called it the pack mentality, the Husky pack. Was it, I believe, five runners were in the top. I said 35 and was quickly corrected to 31, Mr. Bridges, 31. Uh, so uh, we're going to get, we'll have T-shirts that we'll give you on your way out also uh, for exemplifying the mission through your collaborative work. So congratulations again. You truly are uh, one of the prides of Naperville Community and the School District 203. We appreciate how you represent uh, our community on the course, but also in everything that you do in the classroom and in the community. So congratulations, and thank you for such a positive representation of our community. Well, have the parents come on forward. Feel, feel free to take pictures.
some wonderful good news. And we are on to public comment. And just to uh, refresh everyone's, uh, I don't have any slips of anyone who's requested to speak this evening. But just for future information, if you're speaking on behalf of a group, you'd ha we would have five minutes or an individual three minutes before the board. Uh, but that being said, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak that didn't fill out a form? I don't see anyone running up here. So with that, we will go on to the student ambassador reports. Reports. Report. Well, sometimes they share with each other. I, I oh, didn't get it. Oh, yeah. I understand. All right, so um, I'm Bryce Dunlap, uh, the Naperville North Ambassador. Uh, so I'd like to start off by saying, uh, obviously, congrats to the girls' cross-country team for winning state and qualifying for nationals. Um, also, something that's going on around the school within student government, uh, last year we started the grant process, um, and the, the purpose of this was really to help out um, smaller clubs around the school and give back to those uh, clubs. So uh, what what's happening is uh, clubs submit like packets um, uh, asking for a certain amount of money to be donated to, or to be granted to them uh, so they can put it towards their club. Um, and so within student government, we made a subcommittee and um, they decide like how much money should go to what club and stuff. So I think that's really awesome helping out um, all the clubs around the school. Um, and also last year with the grant process, uh, we ha helped out uh, Neverville North TV uh, with this state of the art desk. So uh, this year we're looking, looking to work with the um, Neverville North TV and make uh, promotional videos. Uh, what the videos are gonna be used for um, is things like uh, reviewing the spring, the spring dance theme and uh, also promoting things like the new dance we're having um, after winter break, so. Oh, I'm sorry. For your information, uh, in board docs, the communi uh, written communications are there for your per perusal. And um, next on our agenda, superintendent staff school report. Sure. Uh, initially, just briefly, uh, available for your review is the tentative board planning calendar, which represents a tentative item scheduled for uh, reports, discussion without action, and discussion with action uh, from tonight through uh, February uh, 17th. So that's just, again, just a preview of items we expect to uh, be discussing. Uh, there are some items that may be added or uh, items that are currently on here that may change at some date in the future, but hopefully this just gives you a preview of things that the board will be asked to discuss in coming months. Um, next, I would like to invite uh, Chief School Business Official Brad Kaufman to make some comments regarding the annual audit. Uh, every year we have an independent accounting firm perform an audit of our financial records. Uh, the audit was provided for your review uh, at a previous Board of Education meeting, and uh, Mr. Kaufman now will just give an overview of, uh, of, that, au of that audit. Mr. Kaufman. All right, thank you. Well, in your board packet is a summary of information uh, related to the audit. Um, the end results, the district had a uh, surplus over revenue, uh, over expenditures by $1.9 million for all funds. Um, and we did have a couple of comments from the auditors uh, for needing areas that we can improve on. Uh, we are working to improve those. Uh, one of them being the uh, treasurer's bond. Um, that we do want to actually in, have some more discussion with our uh, attorneys because it's always been our understanding that the 25% was a maximum, not a minimum. And so as long as the board felt comfortable setting that, rain, that amount, um, that that was permittable and that has been done for many years but now the auditors are bringing a question on that. You're speaking about the bond for you representing right. uh, financial interests as opposed to a treasurer's bond. bond. Right. Sorry, excuse right. no, me. No, 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 I, I right. just want to make sure everyone else understands. That. Right. And then, um, you know, capital assets. Uh, we do capitalize our assets uh, and keep track of them, but we don't have a, a, a computer system to uh, provide depreciation uh, schedules. 
And so they have asked us to um, either go through another appraisal, which will provide those, or to pr produce them ourselves. And so we're looking into that. And then finally, uh, just under uh, O&M and B Circular uh, A87, which is audit guidelines for federal government, um, when you ever receive federal funds, there are some uh, timesheet record keeping compliances. And so we're looking to make sure that any employees that work under a federal grant are complying with those timesheets. So other than that, we had a clean audit and uh, we're looking forward to uh, continuing. Any particular questions? Comments or questions? Thank you, thank you very much. All right. Next item was going to be familiar to everyone, Senate Bill 16 update. On Wednesday, November 12th, uh, we hosted a Focus 203 session uh, entitled uh, Senate Bill 16 and its impact on District 203. It was a well-attended event. We had uh, approximately 100 community members who came to Lincoln Junior High School to hear our uh, overview and presentation on Senate Bill 16 and uh, our projected uh, impact of Senate Bill 16 on District 203 if the bill were to be passed in its current uh, state. Uh, I've shared with uh, the Board of Education again uh, and the community the PowerPoint presentation, the presentation materials that were used uh, during that presentation available for your review in case you, um, members of the community have not had an opportunity to go to the website yet. Uh, all of that information as well as video of, of the discussion is posted and available. Uh, as a response to uh, input from the community who attended the session, I also then wrote and sent out a community letter. Uh, on Friday of last week, kind of outlining my position and the district position regarding Senate Bill 16. Uh, and a copy of that letter is provided for you in board docs as well. Uh, I should say that in addition to the approximately 100 individuals that attended the community engagement session, uh, we had another previously scheduled meeting with a group of parents, uh, close to, I think, Mr. Warenga, close to 90. Uh, Mr. Warenga had my script in the PowerPoint and also shared that information with them. So we were able to reach a pretty broad audience um, on. Uh, Wednesday of last week. Uh, as we indicated in the uh, community engagement session, tomorrow uh, two uh, committees, the uh, Education uh, Committee and the Appropriations for Education Committee are, are scheduled to have a joint subject matter hearing, which means that there will be no action to be taken tomorrow, uh, but to hear testimony uh, um, from uh, in interested stakeholders regarding Senate Bill 16. Uh, I will be traveling to Springfield uh, to ensure that uh, our, our position is known uh, and communicated as necessary. Uh, but at this point, uh, you know, I, I, I welcome uh, the state's decision to have a conversation regarding uh, funding of education in the state of Illinois. Uh, but uh, as is pointed out in, uh, in the presentation from last week, uh, information we've, we've shared in, in, in numerous uh, audiences, uh, we believe there's a, a much bigger conversation to be had. And we would hope that uh, our state government would do that in whole uh, and do that in together in session and take its time and do it deliberately and intentionally. Uh, and so I'll uh, report back to the Board of Education after attending uh, the meeting tomorrow. I'd uh, be happy to have any questions or entertain any conversation the Board would like. Um, and I think in, a, in addition, um, the website is fabulous. It gives you a lot of information. It, it ex explains going back to September with the legislative breakfast and then the meetings last week. And also you have a chance to complete, anybody in the community can complete a witness slip and there's a a very, uh, you know, a recipe exactly what to go to and where. It's very specific. It's very easy to use. And then you can voice your uh, opposition to this bill, um, which I know it's all over social media to do it as well. So if you have time for that, if you have time to do that, that would be wonderful. Um, any other comments or questions? Just a compliment on getting the word out with regard to the SB 16 um, Future Focus because a number of the folks I spoke to were people who had never ever been to a Future Focus meeting in the past right. um, but just oh, decided to come out so there was a great effort I think to bring in a broad spectrum from the right. community. Different people. Right? We had different people which right. was also encouraging and a uh, comment was uh, from some individuals who attended that they were really uncertain about this whole small group discussion activity yeah. type format but uh, really found it to be very beneficial so thank you for that. That's fine. Um, next uh, item, President's report. I don't have a report. I wanted to just thank my colleagues for getting to their schools, you know, sometime throughout the year. Also, um, the committees are starting to meet, and thank you for going to the committee work. We're volunteers, and sometimes the dates don't co coincide with our uh, other uh, schedules. And also, um, what Terry started this year, which I thought was phenomenal, is there's alternates. So if you can't make it for some reason, you have a conflict, please look at the alternate and try to let them know. Okay. 
And um, any other Board of Education reports? <coughs> Okie doke. Uh, for your perusal as well in Section 7 of Board Docs, uh, the Treasurer's Report, uh, Investment uh, Report, Insurance, and Budget Report. And with that, Mike, I forgot for Mike's Bills and Claims, can you separate and pull out um, the two uh, meeting minutes, please? Because some people were absent. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, as Jackie uh, insinuated, I was the, had the pleasure of uh, doing bills and claims this month, which means I had the uh, uh, I got to meet with Brad and his staff to uh, review all the bills and claims for the month, every single one, and I found them all in order. So uh, they're doing great work. So therefore, I move approval of warrant number three nine three two six three through warrant number three nine four two nine three, totaling uh, eighteen million three hundred forty thousand seven hundred ten dollars and thirty two cents for the period of October twenty first, twenty fourteen, to November seventeenth, twenty fourteen, and on the consent agenda, uh, eight point oh one oh two oh four and oh five, and uh, that's omitting the board meeting minutes. Thank you. Um, and we will do a roll call vote, please. Ann, please. Second. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Second. Sorry about that. Yedge? Aye. Price? Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Wonky? Yes. Fielden? Yes. Romberg? Yes. Thank Else? you. Motion carries. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Motion carries. Um, I, now, if we can I move the approval of the board meeting minutes for uh, October 20th, 2014. Second. We have a motion to second. Ms. Bell, please. Fitzgerald? Aye. Fielden? Yes. Price? Yes. Robert? Yes. Yes. Aye. Wonky? Yes. Great. Thank you. Motion carries. I also move the approval of the uh, board meeting minutes for November 3rd, 9, November 3rd 9, 2014 as presented. Second. Great. Motion to second. Ms. Bell, please. Wonky? Yes. Robert? Yes. Yes. Aye. Fitzgerald? Aye. Fielden? Abstain. Price? Abstain. Thank you very much. Motion carries. Thank you, um, and we will move on to discussion without action. We have a, um, some financial things to talk about this evening. We do, so I'll invite, uh, go ahead, Mr. Kaufman, Chief School Business Official Brad Kaufman, back to the, the presentation table. Uh, Brad will walk uh, you through a overview of the five-year financial forecast. Uh, last week, we conducted a Citizens Finance uh, Advisory Committee meeting, um, and so shared uh, the five-year financial forecast with them to discuss the uh, assumptions that are contained within it. Uh, the intent tonight is this is an initial presentation. I believe the next uh, scheduled presentation will continue to discuss this at our next board meeting. And then another uh, financial forecast in January. Uh, the intent tonight would be to discuss the contents and the assumptions that are built within this forecast, take some guidance and input from the Board of Education regarding any uh, thoughts about changes for the uh, assumptions that are in it that can be built into future models. Uh, and then from there, we'll, we'll move into a conversation about uh, 2014 tax levy determination. So we'll begin with the five-year financial forecast and uh, Brad. All right. Thank you, Superintendent Bridges. All right. This is the second year that we've used this format. Um, this is a, a software that we purchased through um, PMA, uh, Financial Network. They also provide a consultant, uh, Mike Francis, who helps to um, go through the data and kind of give it a little extra independence, if you will, to going through the assumptions. But as Mr. Bridges said, it's important as we go through the assumptions, I hope you understand how they affect the model, and if any assumptions need to be double-checked on our part or you don't feel comfortable, that's what we're here tonight, because ultimately down the road, this will be the backbone for what becomes the 15-16 budget. So with that being said, um, so what is the uh, financial planning program? Uh, it's just that it's a comprehensive interactive program that's used by about 170 districts statewide. Um, it gathers all sorts of data that I uh, provide to PMA that they put into the model, including all the way down to the detailed salary schedules for teachers and uh, actual detailed tax calculations. Um, it's how we use it, just as it says there, we use it for budget planning, tax levy determination, and obviously what-if scenarios, which we'll go over two of those tonight that we're actually looking at. 
So I already touched on the data elements that we have in there. Um, and each one of those, I'll talk about a sensitivity analysis that will kind of help you place emphasis on which ones are more important than others. Finally, this here is a pie chart of our actual working budget for 1415. As you can note here, 84% uh, of our revenue does come from local property taxes. And so that is the largest, single largest driver for us. Um, also note general state aid, just barely 2.4% of our revenues. So uh, when you're looking at the property tax assumptions with this, uh, there's really two types of levies. There's uh, operating levy, and w which is capped, and then the debt service levy, which is not capped. Um, operating levy is uh, controlled by PTEL, which is property tax extension limit laws, which basically in a nutshell says, hey look, for your existing taxpayers, you can, your tax rate cannot exceed uh, consumer price index or inflation or 5%, whichever is less. And for your new property, you will tax that at the marginal rate that's in place on your existing taxpayers. That's basically what the law says. And then finally, uh, debt service, that's not capped because that was approved by a voter referendum, and so it's outside of PTEL. And it's, I should note, it's automatically levied and less abated by the school board. Uh, if they have to show they have funds to pay the obligation, then they can abate, and that's done in no later than March 31st. So sensitivity analysis. What the purpose of this is is so that you can get an idea for what triggers are most important in the model. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of pieces that go into it. Those are all found in the back of this 80 plus page report. But first off, taxes would be the largest driver. So for each 1% change in the CPI or inflation, that will increase or decrease our revenue by 2.25 million. Now remember, our tax levy is divided 50-50 over two fiscal years. So for 14 tax levy, it's 50% for 14-15, 50% for 15-16. So even though this has a huge driving factor for us, a lot of this factor is known pre us setting our budget. Finally, new property growth. It is taxed at the marginal rate in place at the time the property is, comes on to the tax rolls. For every $1 million, that's $56,000 increase. And then finally, prorating GSA. For every 1%, the state prorates our general state aid. That cost us $70,000 in less revenue. Oh, and I'm sorry, any questions along the way, please just jump in and ask me, all right? All right, finally, uh, so a first major assumption under revenue then would be the consumer price index. We have here uh, 1.5, and we'll talk about this more when we're talking about the 14 levy, but this is the CPI for December 13, which sets the 14 levy, and that's already known. Now for 15 levy, we are estimating a 1.7. Currently, September CPI, September year over year, is 1.7. So unless we see any major change between now and the end of the year, um, we should be pretty much on target. 2.2 is our future estimation. That, I will say, is the five-year average CPI. 10-year uh, is like 4 point, or I'm sorry, 2.48, and 28-year average is right to about 2.8. But we know things are not historically that average right now. All right, new construction. New construction is uh, we just, as you can see there, in levy year 2013, we had 21.1 million. Um, so we're just estimating there based on a flat line of 21 million. Other local assumptions of uh, the corporate personal property replacement tax, we're estimating that to remain flat at about two and a half million. And then other re local revenue remaining pretty much flat with the exception of student fees. 
We have decreased those a little in the model because we have a greater number of free and reduced population, so we're expecting to have more waived fees in the future. Uh, state aid, we're at expecting state aid to still remain at $6,119, and we're also expecting the state to prorate that at about 89%, which they historically have been doing. Other grant categories, we expect to stay flat. And then finally, federal revenue, you see a $2 million decrease. That is because, you know, in this current budget we're in, we are spending some carryover funds that had been accumulating. So those will not be in the future. Finally, expenditures. Salaries and benefits are the largest portion of our budget. And we, so um, we continue to monitor that. And those are assumptions that are built in uh, into the budget also. All right, sensitivity analysis, same thing. What's important for us to worry about on the expenditure side? Since salaries and benefits are the largest portion, for each 1% increase in salary, we're looking at about $1.5 million additional cost. For every 1% change in health or dental insurance, about $250,000. And then finally, one that's looming out there, the TRS pension reform or pension shift. Uh, for each 1% shift that the state did decide to shift over the district would cost us about $1.2 million. We do have built into the model a half a percent shift starting in 1516 and progressing a half percent thereof. What are the assumptions built into the model? Well, of course, we have current contracts for all employees built in, what we currently have. If we don't have a contract with the union right now, we're really basing it off prior settlement. So, for example, for teachers, we're looking at uh, having an estimated base increase of what was the last time, 67% of CPI, with a max min of 1.4, max of 2.5, plus their steps and lanes. Um, for the other employees, it's really based off of what we've historically had uh, contract settlements. Finally, with health insurance, um, we did just finish our process for going through renewals, and for now we're on a calendar year, which is new. Um, so for calendar year 2015, we will see 0% increase. So we think we're very good with looking in the forward future for 3 to 5% increase going forward. But we do have a 0% for this year. Other assumptions, <clears throat> we're basing these off of uh, inflation. We're estimating inflation in the future, about around 2%, as I said. And so we have in the Ed Fund, we have a 2% increase for our um, operating cost, with the exception of special ed tuition, which ultimately is based on salaries and benefits, because it really is salaries and benefits of the other entity. And so that's the driving cost. So it's, of course, it's going to be higher than, uh, than the others. And then finally, under O&M, you see there, uh, 2% for purchase services, but supplies, within supplies, this is where utilities are recorded. So that's the big cost driver there. Uh, so we anticipate some additional increase in utilities. Finally, transportation and tort, 3%. And then we have across all funds, we maintain a contingency of 1.3 million for unforeseens. This is the assumption that we're working on the most. Um, we do plan to have an uh, in update for this assumption before by our January next update. Um, we're currently working on our enrollment projections. So we have built in there flat staffing for our certified staff. We don't anticipate that to be. We know we're anticipating a declining enrollment but we haven't validated that yet. But once we do, we will be making adjustments to this because this is very conservative. We're saying we're holding it flat, and we know that's probably not going to be the case. All right, no other, uh, as far as assumptions go, we believe that, you know, at this point, built into this model, we will go over a what if, but built in the base model, we're saying there's going to be no change to the GSA, no change to uh, PTEL. already touched on the half percent shift for um, the phase in on the TRS. Finally, another big one out there for us. We have um, known retirees. We have 157 people right now 
but we have 171 qualified people who could give notice and you know we're sunsetting so March of 2015 is the last time to declare for early retirement under the program we have 171 people qualified we're anticipating that about 111 of those will take advantage of that last opportunity for those people going out we have been backfilling them with a new model with an ma step five and hr just confirmed today that that is what our average new hire was for 14 15. and then finally we went through our budget and we've updated our current 14 15 budget to the best of our knowledge and we call it with a working budget because that there then makes our projections that much more accurate so so here's a first impossible to read so you probably look at it in your in your packets but uh, this is the base model and as you can see here we are anticipating to have a um, small surplus over our uh, re expenditure re over revenues um, and continue to uh, maintain and then start to decline in our um, fund balance or cash reserves before early taxes and you know we try to that goal as the district is to maintain that at 10 percent um, under this base model by 2020 we'd be down to three 13.6 percent um, this is a graphical representation of that the red line is the fund balance and the blue line is the cash balance before taxes and so you can see there we're getting dangerously low down to that uh, would be closer to that 10 percent the question was asked uh, so what is the impact to the district if we under levy the levy uh, one percent under what's allowed by law or inflation um, and this is just for the 2014 levy um, it's critical how this really impacts the district this is just a one-time uh, adjustment and you can see under this model over the five-year scenario this would reduce the district's revenue by 13.3 million and actually bring us by 2020 to 9.45 percent of our cash reserves before taxes which is below the district's guidelines from the school board this is a graphical representation you can see what kind of a hit that does as it's a non uh, well when you under levy on the PTEL or the or the inf the mechanism it's impossible to recoup it by law there's no way to recoup it and it's a cumulative effect so it's not just the one time but it continues to accumulate uh, as it moves forward so you can see the impact there finally under a separate scenario this is of course going back to the base having all the assumptions but then now applying this one and that would be what happens if Senate Bill 16 was actually passed or in its current form I would say um, this is a big big impact to the district um, it's actually estimated total loss of 33.7 million over the next five years that it takes the model takes into account the lower cash reserve so we'd also be losing interest income um, also so you can see by this model by 2020 we would be down to two percent cash reserves by before taxes um, assuming we made no budget reductions okay so you can see that this has a big impact on the district finally the last scenario again going back to the base and then making for this um, adjustment would be abating uh, the debt service at a hundred percent each year this requires as you can see there towards the bottom requires just over a three million dollar transfer from the operating funds to the debt service to pay the debt the interest and principal on our debt um, this actually has a 16.2 million dollar uh, five-year impact on the district 
uh, as it would reduce our revenues also. Bringing us to an estimated 8.1% cash reserves before taxes, well under the, uh, the district's 10% um, cash reserves. Okay, that is the financial forecast model. Any additional questions or any of the assumptions that we want to make sure we, we address? Brad, can I just mention one thing? First, I would like um, you or, or um, Dan to talk about your recommendation, but also I just wanted to share that Susan Karate and I sat with the Finance Committee last week and heard the same presentation, and there were very few questions. It was very, um, uh, some new people on the committee and some seasoned uh, senior people on the committee. Um, there are a couple of questions I'll just share with everyone. One was, uh, was, was energy in the CPI number, and it is very important. Uh, the um, the level amount of teachers and you gave the same response that we have to wait and look at the demographics that you were going to look at that number um, and then also what was the timing of the uh, of the debt service uh, uh, what was the timing of abating not abating right. uh, the end of March so um, and they were um, they were in support of the administrator's recommendation which they'll which was in our document but I'll have you share right what do we want to have you just go ahead and go through the the tax levy recommendation. Okay, that would be a great mm -hmm. segue into that. <laughs> and then we can come back and take questions Perfect. on both. How's that? Perfect. Okay. All right, these two pieces obviously tie very much together. And so, as we say here, um, the complete to complete the financial picture, we need to talk about the district's tax levy. Um, we're here to talk about the 2014 levy. And let me just grab out my notes and I'll be ready. Okay, so, whoops, I'm sorry. Is uh, We just finished discussing the FPP, and like it says here, this is a very <coughs> critical link. In fact, it represents 84% of the district's revenue and very much the driver behind the district's budget. We will just add, it's been interesting as we've had the Senate Bill 16 kind of hearings, we've heard a lot from our local legislators, and it was very interesting to hear a couple of them say, you know, the state of Illinois has chosen the path that local property taxes would be the backbone of local districts funding sources that's the path they've chose and you know that in other states um, state revenues make up a greater percentage uh, illinois 50 ranks 50 on the list for um, state funding from to public education all right, so the 2014 tax levy is governed by the Truth and Taxation, uh, School Code, Property Tax Code, and then finally, PTEL. And so it's my job to make sure that all of those are complied with. So first, Truth and Taxation. Um, truth of Taxation only applies if you have a levy that is going to be greater than 5%. So actually, um, even though we're going to be, well, we also have to do, though, estimate our levy within with 20 days prior, but we will not need to go through the uh, publishing the notice or hold a public hearing because we will be below the 5%. So um, finally, uh, as far as timeline, which is uh, spelled out in the school code and in the property tax code, we must estimate the levy at least five day, 20 days in advance. So we will do that tonight with our tax determination. Um, we adopt the levy by December 15th, and it must be filed no, by the last Tuesday in the month of December. So that's the 30th. And then finally, if you're going to bait any bonds, it must be filed with the county by March 31st. Uh, PTEL, I've already pretty much described PTEL, but in essence, what it really says is that you know, you can only tax your existing taxpayers at an increase of inflation. And then new construction will be taxed at the marginal rate that is being taxed on the existing property. And then um, we don't know uh, new construction, so we we'll always estimate that a little high. Um, last year we had 21 million. 
in this proposed uh, levy that I'm going to show you tonight, we have 40 million in there as a little cushion. Okay, uh, we won't levy any more than that uh, than what the new construction is. Once the final new construction is known, the county treasurer just simply adjusts the levy based on that final new construction number. And so that's just a final little adjustment that they make. So besides benchmarking uh, ourselves educationally, uh, we also benchmark ourselves financially. <laughs> so um, this here is the western uh, suburb, uh, Luda districts. As you can see there, it's Indian Prairie, ourselves, St. Charles, Wheaton, Warrenville, but, uh, Barrington, Elmhurst, Geneva, and Batavia. Um, what we're benchmarking here is our total equalized assessed value. You can see here that 203, and I try to make these lines a little bolder, but um, so the green top line there, you can see is our line. That's our total uh, equalized assessed value. Our assessed value has been very stable and has remained relatively strong during this tough economic times. This here is a graphical representation of our equalized assessed value per student. Um, here you can see that uh, District 203 is second highest assessed value per student, ranked just above, which is very hard to see, but we are just above Elmhurst, which is the orange line. Uh, we do slightly slide above them, and we're just below Barrington, which is the red line, Barrington 220. Um, I already mentioned our EAV has been held very strong. Our average decline for this group of benchmarking districts was been 4.06, while our average decline has only been 3.44. Um, if you look at the average decline per student, um, the group has reclined at three, declined at 3.79, while we've declined at 2.61, which has brought us up, as you can see. Our line is kind of staying flat while theirs is declining. Tax rates. Uh, when we benchmark against the same group, you can see there our, we have the fourth lowest tax rate uh, for 2013 at $5.38. So fourth lowest tax rate. So in this proposed 2014 levy, we're proposing that we do tax our existing taxpayers at an increase of 1.5%, which is the 2013 inflation rate. We have uh, estimated new construction at 40 million. Based on all of this, if that will, gives us an estimated levy increase of 2.48%, which includes new construction and debt service. What's the impact to a, an existing taxpayer? If you had a fair market value home of 375000 you on average, you would expect then your taxes to increase $102 for the upcoming year, or 1.5%. Um, we actually are having a small um, decline in the, the uh, debt service rate. Here again, it's impossible for you to read these numbers. This information was in, uh, included in your um, documents. When I say a small on the, when I, I want to make sure I'm clarify this correctly, based on an impact of a $375,000 home, um, we're anticipating that the actual rate on the debt service would actually drop 55 cents. Uh, it's bringing us to the $102 increase. Going over all the numbers, though, you can see our total levy last year, $223 million. We're estimating a levy of $228 million, or 2.48% increase. And we're estimating that our EAV will end at about a negative 2.3%. Now, remember... Assessed value is a rolling three-year average. So even though we're seeing property values increasing now, it's going to take a few years for that to roll off because it is on a three-year rolling average. So we have to roll off those negative years 
and roll, bring in the new years before we'll see the overall start to come up, okay? And with that, here's our recommendation. We do recommend levying the full 1.5% increase on existing taxpayers. We recommend that the board not abate the debt service levy at this time, but that the board should wait and reconsider this um, at the March of 2015 when we have more known information as it relates to Senate Bill 16, pension cost shifting, and just finally where the state revenues may be if they've, if they've given us any more indication by then. So with that, we take questions. Four questions, I would just simply reiterate the point that uh, Ms. Romberg made is that this was the recommendation presented to the Citizens Finance uh, Advisory Committee last week and they supported this recommendation. Questions, comments? <clears throat> Good. So I noticed in the projections that there was no increase to capital outlay. Um, I, I, this isn't a question I want to answer today, but maybe going forward. Um, we have a facility master plan that's coming, and so is that taking that into account or no? Because we haven't seen that entirely yet. Well, I, the answer I'd say is kind of. How do you like that answer? <laughs> okay, so, you know, we are in the process of bringing together a complete new capital plan. That's not to say we haven't had plans in the past or that Mr. Mathis hasn't been working to make sure things are kept up. We have built within our O&M budget a standard amount that he's been using to continue to make these repairs and maintenances. What we don't have in there is we have made some, you know, additions to some of the buildings. We've added multi-purpose rooms. Those we've paid cash for those. Those we have no. That's not built in there. But we do have built in there, if you will, kind of the core where we think we need to maintain. Now, when we finish the the facility plan, if the facility plan comes back with some extraordinary things that the board and the administration agrees needs to be done, we will need to have a discussion in the next budget cycle of what, how and we would go ahead and fund those, okay? But for normal capital repairs and renewal, we have built into the budget to manage that. Any other comments or questions? Kristen? So I wish we had this presentation when people were asking at the SB 16 meeting, what's the actual impact of SB 16? Because I think this outlines it really well, where you, where you had that sheet with all the facts. I mean, that real complicated sheet. But in that, let me just make sure that I'm correct, in that an analysis that has the SB 16, where you have the out years, you're assuming and the, the, the increase were allowed, correct, in terms of the tax levy? Right. You're just, right. So that's the basic, you know, people are saying, well, what would the tax hit be? And there's no tax hit because you're putting that in there and there's still no way to make it up. So it, it was just interesting because that, that was discussed over and over at the, at the forum. And that really shows it in a nice red way in terms of what the actual impact would be with regard to SB 16. Um, and so obviously we're in a huge difficulty because without knowing whether or not that's going to go forward, right. real difficult to say that we can do anything differently than just go ahead and go forward. Um, however, I do have a question. If we were to go forward with a levy and then, you know, SB 16 gets totally taken off the table, you, you, of course, could go back and abate debt service. Could you abate any other kinds of things? Could we go back and abate our levy in any way or under that same time frame? Or would it just be we would go, we could do the debt service and that would be the opportunity? And Right, right. So under state law, um, once the board approves and certifies an operating levy, now realize, remember, on an annual basis, you do not certify a debt service. That was done at the referendum. Correct. So that's why it's a different and it has Correct. a different timeline. Yeah. But once you certify a tax levy, it's my understanding that once that's certified and filed with the county, that you are not able to, like, quote, abate it, you know, change it. 
once it's filed and certified. Okay. Tonight is just an estimate, though. Right. Tonight, I know. We're not I, right. Could you verify that that and make Certainly. sure that's correct? Because I, I, I think I you feel can like I remember back, the yeah. one. I think you can go back too. But could you just check that? Certainly. Okay. That was just one question. Um, and then my a couple of my other questions relate to the difficulty of estimating, which I understand is your difficulty as well. Um, without knowing the population estimates, I, I looked in your um, data book, and it looks like you've got small reductions of student populations that are that remain in the plan, even though you're still waiting for some additional feedback about what exactly w those reductions will be. Is that correct? That. You're right. Okay. We have built in there small, but the key to that is because we felt not real, that we could rely on those small uh, or on those enrollment projections per se, we've held the staffing flat. Right. So in a sense, we could have entered in any number in the enrollment. What's critical is how that affects staffing. Right. right. So that's something, obviously, as we go forward with our discussion, um, that information is very helpful, and the sooner that you get that, the rest, how that impacts all the rest of these things, because it changes all the red numbers when you put that in. Given that that's our biggest factor, right. that changes everything. I did have a question as to whether or not you use those small population reductions in our other variables. So, for example, when you're looking at supplies, are you saying, okay, well, this will be for 84 or less students, or yeah, are, right. are those included in there or, or not? No. Well, okay. um, you know, the model is very detailed, but we don't get down to, you know, if we're going to have 100 less students, what impact will that have on supplies? Mm -hmm. We don't, the model can't, it doesn't have enough flexibility to model that. Okay, so we basically so, use the 2% figure and we say this is our average CPI. Yeah. For the years that we know, we would put in accurate figures, correct? And then, like, if, if we knew that it was only 1.5? Right, we, right, right. I mean, as soon as we know. In fact, that, you know, the next major update is January, and we'll have an update then because we'll know the December CPI, which then we can adjust everything else out in the model. Okay. So that will just be mainly we're utilizing that demographic information simply for the staffing projections. Right. The rest of it, even if you were to have the exact what we really think, doesn't really make a difference for you in terms of the population. No, but if you, you know, no, it doesn't. But if you look at the driving driving forces of the model, staffing is a big part of that. Right. So that's why without a doubt. The, the enrollment is linked up with that. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay. Um, could you give us an understanding too? I, I don't know if you have it now, probably not, but in terms of how this will impact our per student cost. So this would be the, you know, your recommended projection. And mm -hmm. if we were to move forward with that, how that changes that number? I don't have the specific calculation, but I can tell you, generally speaking, you know, um, we have a considerable amount of fixed overhead, if you will. And so as we continue to decline, you know, um, we can make certain adjustments right off the bat, like staffing ratios in the classroom. You know, we have fewer students, we adjust those, you know, and you saw that this last year. We had all day kindergarten come on, which required 11 FTEs, and yet we ended up almost offsetting that completely by having fewer other classroom teachers other places. And so right. those classroom teachers, you know, those and those kind of direct related staffings, those are those are done right along the way to come without even missing a beat. What is more difficult is for us to come across the entire operations and to go in and say, okay, we now have 30 less students or 100 less students. We're going to reduce, say, my department, for example. Well, just because we have 100 less students doesn't mean we're going to have fewer accounts payables. Right. Or and we're going to have, you know, sure, we're going to have a few less staff, but we still right. have to process payroll, you know, every two weeks. And so there's some fixed costs that really don't adjust, you know, per se. I'd kind of say, I'd describe it as stepped cost. They're going to go down when you have enough enrollment go down that you're able to eliminate a whole one of whatever. You know, like if we had enough, you know, staff to use my office, maybe we come to the point where we don't need one whole payroll person per se. And so then you would have that reduction, but you'd have to have a lot of change to be able to make that one big change. Without a doubt. I, I don't actually mean, I just mean if you took this model that we're going forward, we have a per pupil cost right now. What will the per pupil cost be next year utilizing those same figures? Well, right. And I can calculate that right. out. Um, 
Okay. And I just want, just for the uh, public, just to understand, these are projections. Right. And projections are very different than a budget. Okay. I know right. you certainly understand that. But um, there is, I'm a proponent of conservative projections and consistent projections. Until you get something that you know is better and more credible, if you start to get, if you start to get so smart on different things, your projections really don't work out too well. So, but that's right. very different. Where we where we need to make sure we understand is is when the budget's developed, and to Kristen's point, how that will all come into these other numbers. So I understand. Mm -hmm. So just that point of clarification. Do you have another question? Yeah. Let me just make sure everybody else is gone. For, go ahead. So on the scenarios that you've given us, thank you for all of those. Um, on scenario one, where we have the 1% um, reduction in PTEL, mm -hmm. that's a one-time, uh, and I think if I understand this correctly, that's a one-time this year 1% reduction, and then that's how it carries through, correct? That, that correct. is correct. Okay. So then for scenario, um, and I know two is the Senate bill, but then for scenario three, you've given us um, a scenario for debit service abatements for every year going out, and mm -hmm. that's not necessarily something that carries through, that's a decision that's made right. every year. Correct. Exactly. So, so can you also provide a scenario for where we only have the um, debit service abatement for this coming, like for this decision that we have before we make that decision? Because the impact of one is very gonna be very different than the impact of five. So to be clear, you're asking for a debt service abatement for the upcoming debt service? And then for the current year, right? For the current year, and then okay, no problem. Uh, do you want me just to replace that with the full debt, or just add another scenario? I, just add another. Yeah, just add, add okay, another. that's thank fine. you, Terry. Yeah, first of all, Brad, um, going back to some of your assumptions, it, when you did this last year, you know, we, we had uh, been going on the belief that uh, CPI was like 2.5 percent or was a little higher. In, in some of our past models, right? So you actually be, be, before you, or was it always at two point two point two percent? I think I actually brought a lot of There you go. So uh, you know, if I had the page to oh, here we go. Um, no, I thought I had the page. You get there first. Oh, here we go. We had, so in our model from last year. Yeah, your, your model from last year, but before you arrived. Oh, before I arrived. Yes. Oh. oh. Make something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell 2. you in, 5 last, had been used in, in yes. last year's <laughs> model, we yeah. had uh, projected for the 14 being 1.5, which was actual. And then we had projected from 15 forward was, to 2.2. I was actually going to compliment you. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, Shoot, wow. I missed my chance. So I was saying, let him get there. Yeah, whoa, baby. Because I think that using yeah. the 2.2, it seems to be better, a better panning out. Right. And uh, it's, I agree with you, it, it, it more conservative and probably the way to go. The other part that I appreciate on this is the 1% the reduction model, where you're showing mm -hmm. the, the long-term hit to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's very good because I've seen other districts dis elect to go ahead and uh, take a lever reduction. And then the following year, I've seen reports come back and say, well, this is the long-term impact that's, that's done to the district. So sometimes the boards can make these decisions in the absence of a long-term projection. So compliments to you on doing that. The other part I, I had a question on, on was, and you probably don't have this answer, but on the property values, um, uh, the average of $21 million a year, is, is that based on new housing or does it include some other sort of uh, construction that goes with that? Do you know? I mean, yeah. that, um, it, it, the reason I asked uh, is yeah. we, it, in 2010 we had, you know, $106 million, which I understand uh, probably was related to housing, but how, what's, what's the general assumption on construction growth uh, for that? What, what market sector? You know, um, We've had, and I can, I'll pull it, what we actually had last year, but, you know, we've had increases not only just in house. In fact, commercial has been stronger for the district um, than actual housing. Okay. Realizing housing-wise, we're, we're pretty much built out. So I, I'll need to double-check with the assessor, but I believe that when you do a complete teardown and a rebuild, 
the new the new additional mount that comes on after a rebuild would be considered new growth. Okay. Not the original that it was assessed, but that new or so. So if somebody tears down the three hundred thousand dollar house and puts up a two point five million dollar house. Exactly. We got two point two million of new growth. New, new construction. You're right, of new right. construction. And I'm pretty sure but I can confirm on that one. But I do know after speaking with um, our assessors that commercial has been stronger for us yeah. than residential. Yeah, commercial's been very strong for the last year. And they and don't half. bring kids to the schools. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Sure. Thank you for the detail, the organization, and the ability to be able to read it clearly. And now that we're, we've seen it the second time, you know, the Good. second time through, it's, it's much easier to Good. look at it. So thank you so much for all your work on that. You're welcome. And I, I hope as we continue on, and like you said, you know, second year, you know, we'll get more familiar and, and know things will go easier. Great. So we'll come back with responses to questions that were asked at our next Board of Education meeting, continue to discuss, and then uh, look for action on uh, December 15th. For the estimate, correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, no, uh, next uh, item on our agenda, we have two discussion with action items. At the last Board of Education meeting, our learning services team presented to the Board of Education an update on extended learning opportunity uh, program, our online con blended consortium with districts 200 and 204, and made some recommendations for uh, new courses. I don't believe we've had any new questions come forward. We'll entertain any questions you may have at this time. I just wanted to be in John's class. <laughs> It sounded like it was really a great class. It really did. Um, any questions or comments? Entertain a motion, please. I'll make a motion to pass. Um, do you want to put them together or no? Uh, no, separate, please. 10.01 ELO update and new courses. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second for um, ELO update and new, class, uh, new courses. Any other questions or comments? No. Ms. Bell? Price? Yes. Romberg? Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Fielded? Yes. Wonky? Yes. Yes. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Summer school. And at the last Board of Education meeting, Deputy Superintendent Kane Osborne and our summer school director, Kevin Olkevich, uh, provided the Board of Ed Education a presentation on recommendations for the upcoming summer school 2015. I don't believe we've had any additional questions. Kane, any additional comments? So we'll take any questions or comments you may have now. Otherwise, hope for some action. Uh, motion, please. Make a motion to approve item 10.02, Summer School 2015. Second. We have a motion to second for item 10.02, Summer School 2015. Any additional comments or questions? Ms. Bell, please. Fielded? Yes. Price? Yes. Wonky? Yes. Yes. Aye. Robert? Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Motion carries, thank you very much. And next in our agenda, our schedule of events. Um, busy, December always is kind of a busy month for only half a month of school. Um, any, any plugs? Okay. Um, with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, it's a tiny plug. It's yeah. just a tiny final report. I got an email from our NEF um, team that yeah. raised seventeen thousand dollars for awesome. NEF through the running the half marathon. Right. Awesome. Yay, and how are the runners feeling? How are the runners feeling? <coughs> oh, we have uh, whatever. Yes, he's sharing. I'm, he's uh, a share. I'm grateful it was last Sunday, not yeah. yesterday. How that's yeah. for sure. Hello. Oh, that you know what? How yeah. about that? Timing's yep. everything, right? Yep. Sounds good. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So Please. moved. Thank you. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you in two weeks from tonight.